So welcome everybody to this talk on Thy course shall from its tomb be rent, Lord Byron and Vampires. So if you don't know me, my name is Dr. Sam Hurst. You can contact me at my Nottingham email there, sam.hurst at nottingham.ac.uk if you have any questions or comments about the talk or you want to contact me to come do a talk for you. Um, I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Nottingham and an academic resident at Newstead Abbey, which is, of course, the ancestral home of Byron. Today, I'm going to be talking about the connections between Byron and vampires. And you might be looking at these two pictures and thinking, well, neither of these was actually written by Byron. Don't worry, I know. We'll come back to what these pictures are, what they represent and why they might be important later in the talk. So as I said, we're talking about the connections between Byron and vampires, and there's going to be four different sections to today's talk. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the vampiric background. So these are the ideas of the vampire that existed um, in the 18th century and, um, and the early 19th century. So the ideas with which Byron was interacting. We're also going to be thinking a little bit about what evidence we have about what texts Byron had actually read um, and how we can see those influencing his work. So um, we'll then talk about Byron actually writing the vampire himself um, and thinking about the Jawa in from 1813. In the third section, we're going to think about Byron's role in changing vampiric history, not necessarily through what he wrote, but what he influenced. And obviously we'll be thinking there about some of the complicated publishing history um, and origin history of Polidori's The Vampire. And then I'm gonna sort of sum up at the end by thinking about what the idea of the vampire is that he is engaging with and how is he using the vampire. So first of all, let's give you some vampiric background. Now I don't know what everybody knows, so I'm going to give a sort of potted history here. Um, as many of you will know, in the 18th century, the vampire came to prominence in the vampire boom across Europe. Now, this was related particularly to two famous vampire cases. The first was in 1725, um, and it involved the Serbian peasant Peter Blažević. And apologies there, guys, about my pronunciation if any of these are wrong. Um, in the, this story, uh, uh, this peasant died and then there was a spate of sudden deaths and each of the um, people who died during the period of their decline reported that Peter had visited them and throttled them in the night. So it started to be believed that Peter had become a vampire and so he was disinterred but the people of the village didn't simply disinter him they insisted that the priest attended and also the Austrian imperial provisor Ernst Frommelt. When the body was disinterred, there were signs of vampirism. So there was new growth of skin, hair and nails. There was blood around the mouth and there was no decomposition. The body was then staked and apparently fresh blood or red blood um, came out of the heart. Now, this was probably one of many vampire incidents that were occurring in the area. But what made this famous and made it sort of the talk of Europe was the report by the imperial provisor Ernst Rumbold, which then got sent back to the Austrian court and disseminated. And we know it got as far, for example, as French newspapers. However, the real boom began after uh, 1732 and the publication of reports about the Arnold Paul case. So there are actually two outbreaks connected to Arnold Paul. He was a Serbian Hajduk who, during his life, reported being bitten by a Turkish vampire. He thought he'd escape the curse by eating the grave soil of the vampire. But when he died, an outbreak of vampirism started to occur. There was, again, a spate of sudden deaths. Um, and these deaths had very similar symptoms to those of Peter Budjevic and the the people who were dying reported similar symptoms that he was visiting them. Now, he was summarily dealt with in a typical way, but there was another outbreak a number of years later. And this is what leads to the sort of 1732 case. Now, the Austrian court sent the Imperial Contagions Medicus Glazier and also a military surgeon called Johann, Johann Flukinger. When the bodies were disinterred of the numerous vampires, which are now said to exist, many of them were found in that same vampiric state. So body was somewhat fluid, decomposition was not advanced, there was new growth of hair and nails, there was blood in the mouth, etc. 
Now, these met a somewhat more violent end. They were decapitated and the ashes of the burnt parts of their body were scattered in the river. Now, again, these reports were sent back and then they were widely disseminated, leading to a debate which stretched across Europe and produced a, a sort of massive amount of writing. So investigating the vampire became popular in a number of European countries. It started with the investigation of these specific events, which relied for the possibility of validity on expert testimony and witness. This then led on to newspaper, popular and political debates. There was even sort of philosophical debate and questions of theology raised. How could vampires exist? How did this tie in with existing structures of Christian belief? Could the soul be trapped in the body, for example. As Nick Groom notes, 12 books and four dissertations on vampirism appeared in 1732 to three. And over the next three years, a further 22 learned treatises were published in European cultural and intellectual centers, such as Amsterdam, Halle, Jena, Leipzig, and Vienna. One of the most famous of the treatises was, of course, Augustine Calmet's. You can see a title page here in French, but it was a treatise on the traits of um, apparitions, spirits and vampires or revenants of Hungary, Moravia, etc. This was a text that looked at lots of different potential supernatural incidents, but included a compendium of vampiric incidents as well. It didn't just report these incidents, but also regarded them with a sceptical eye, investigating these claims and their possibility. So as I've mentioned, Calme's broad attitude was fairly sceptical. But in the end, he said, we can't really explain all of the reports here and everything that's been reported. So there isn't a final solution offered to what is happening with the vampire. Now, vampires are not like ghosts. They didn't lead on to then centuries of discussions about whether they were real or not. Both um, sort of in Europe, after that rash of vampire treaties in the 1730s, the monster ceased to provide an object of serious contemplation. It was dismissed largely as a superstition or folklore and the number of sort of medical explanations or quasi-scientific explanations were, were put forward. But as Butler noticed, when the sort of tales of the vampire arrived in Britain, particularly in 1732 after the Arnold Paul case, um, the phlegmatic English reacted with lofty scorn from day one. Now that's perhaps overstating it, but certainly the vampire as it arrived in Britain arrived as sort of tales of a folklore that existed elsewhere. There wasn't really a serious question about whether vampires existed. And indeed in British writing right from the beginning, we see the vampire being used more metaphorically and allegorically straight away. So in the Gentleman's Magazine from 1732, for example, the writer tries to explain how we can understand the tale of um, Arnold Paul and how we can understand these outbreaks. And he gives a sort of political allegory. He says, this is actually sort of what's happening here. Is this a political message? So I'll just read the quotation here. It says, these vampires are said to torment and kill the living by sucking out all their blood. And a ravenous minister in this part of the world is compared to a leech or a bloodsucker and carried his oppressions beyond the grave by anticipating the public revenues and entailing a perpetuity of taxes, which must gradually drain the body politic of its blood and spirits. So here we see the idea of either an aristocratic or um, a sort of governmental vampire as well, a drain on those lower in the system. Um, we also see, um, a connection with sexuality and the vampire. So one of the earliest examples of the vampire appearing in literature, in British literature, is a very brief mention in John Cleland's The Memoirs of Coxcomb. So if you don't know John Cleland, he was a writer of erotic fiction or erotica in Britain in the 18th century. And he makes reference to a vampire in telling the story of uh, a noble woman who employed a wet nurse basically to suckle not a babe but a grown man in a sort of sexual act. Um, we're told that this woman could not however prevail over the nurse to conquer her fears and aversions so far as to suckle this babe of delight but by dint of increasing her hire and then with her face averted she gave him her breast which he fastened upon and looked more like a sucking demon or a vampire escaped from his grave than a human creature. So we have this kind of metaphorical use of the vampire here connected with sexuality, particularly perhaps predatory sexuality. 
So these are sort of ideas that you might want to think about again when we get back to Byron's use of the vampire. Now, the vampire didn't arrive simply after the Arnold Paul case in England. There are a number of other existing reports that informed the British imaginary around the vampire. And I'm going to go through a number of these and talk about how likely it is that Byron would have interacted with these particular narratives. Now, I'm going to start with one of the earliest, which is in one of the editions of Henry Moore's An Antidote Against Atheism, 1653, Henry Moore tells the story of what is essentially a vampire. It's unlikely that Byron read this, but we can't sort of um, dismiss its potential impact on the, the British imaginary more broadly. It's also one of my favourite vampire stories. Now, we don't have to read the whole text because happily, right at the beginning of the story, it just gives us a summary of the key points. So these are the key points of two memorable stories with the credibility of them, i.e. credible stories. The first is of a shoemaker of Breslau who cut his own throat and his appearing after death in his usual habit and his vexatious haunting of the whole town. He was dug up after he'd been eight months buried and his body was found entire and fresh and his joints limber and flexible. And then upon the burning thereof, the apparition ceased. The second incident, which also happened in a maid of his when she had vexed and disturbed people for a whole month together. But the relator of the story lived in the town at what time these things fell out. So this is a story that's being attested to as something witnessed by the writer. So there's a number of features here that we might find common to vampire tales, even as we understand them today. Um, a return from the dead, haunting a body that is uncovered, that seems to be almost living. Um, the cure for vampirism here is fire, which is quite often the case in these early accounts. We also have vampirism linked to a sort of sense of cursing or punishment. In this case, there is this, what we would now consider obviously a problematic connection with suicide um, and a body that can't rest or a person or a soul that can't rest. Um, the reason I've picked this out, though, is not to point out these more common features, but to show you some of the diversity that we find in these early vampire stories. We're used to a fairly kind of set narrative or conception of the vampire. But when it first is trickling into the British consciousness and in the sort of 18th century folkloric and superstitious and folk beliefs that are bounded, the vampire isn't quite as set in place. So this is the story of the maid and what happened to her. So it happened that she died after him and appeared within eight days after her death to her fellow servant and lay so heavy upon her that she brought upon her a great swelling of her eyes. She so grievously handled the child in the cradle that if the nurse had not come in to his help, he had been quite spoiled. But she crossing herself and calling upon the name of Jesus, the spectre vanished. The next night, she appeared in the shape of a hen perhaps the unexpected bit, which when one of the maids of the house took to be so indeed and followed her, the hen grew into an immense bigness and presently caught the maid by the throat and made it swell so that she could neither well eat nor drink of a good while after. So there's some interesting things to pick out here. First of all, this connection of how the vampire operates. A lot of these early narratives don't really talk about blood, but instead this sense of suffocation. And there has been quite a lot of discussion in vampire theorization about how this might connect to the idea of night terrors and that sense of waking up, unable to move and having something compressing your chest. Um, we also have this idea of religion in some sense as the cure for vampirism or as a weapon against it. But what's most interesting, of course, is this giant hen. Um, I would really love a film that leans into this and has uh, vampires converting into chickens, but alas, it has not become part of the standard law. Here's this, this, this ambitious chicken for you. One of the next kind of important accounts of the vampire comes from Paul Ricoeur's present state of the Greek and Arminian churches. There's two dates here. The first is the original publication in French um, or Latin, I can't remember, sorry, and the second is the translation into English from 1679. Now, I'll talk about um, a, a little bit later the kind of chances of Byron reading this, but more broadly, it's quite a, a popular and influential account in some ways. It presents a particular understanding of vampirism as a curse, um, connected to a particular religious understanding of how it occurs. 
So as you can see here, the quotation that I'll read briefly that explains the general law around um, vampires or Rukalaka is that they believe that the bodies of the excommunicated are possessed in the grave by some evil spirit which actuates and preserves them from corruption in the same manner as the soul informs and animates the living body, that they feed in the night, walk, digest, and are nourished, and have been found ruddy in complexion, and their veins, after forty days' burial, extended with blood, which, being opened with a lancer, have yielded a gore as plentiful, fresh, and thick as that which issues from the vessels of young and sanguine persons. So this idea of the vampire, particularly connected to a Greek Orthodox conception, and this is repeated and um, in Cal May's book as well, um, the idea that it's excommunication that leads to vampirism. It's a particularly theological punishment. We also have um, a lot of the common features that we'll come to expect, the lack of corruption. The idea of the vampire is active at night. It's also noticeable here that there's not necessarily mention of blood drinking as such. The vampires in this account do eat other things. And the um, one way to try and stop the vampire from coming out of the coffin um, that is described in this account is putting food in there with them to stop them. Um, but we do have, again, this kind of common idea as well of the blood that comes out of the corpse. And you can see the ties there to these concepts of blood drinking and blood consumption. Now, again, this idea of there's actually a diversity of vampire lore at the time. One of the cures suggested for a vampire, a specific vampire account that appears in this narrative, is that the vampire be cut up, dismembered and boiled in wine as a way to get rid of the vampire. Um, we don't often see that as a cure today, but it's an interesting one. A next account, which Byron might have had access to, is it's published in the Harley and Missinleys of 1745. Um, is that of the travels of three English gentlemen from Venice to Hamburg from 1734. And they recount superstitions that existed in Carniola in modern Slovenia. But they also mention the existence of these folk tales and, and this folklore in Poland, Serbia, Hungary, Moravia, Lithuania, Russia, as they put it, Greeks or Greece, and Austria. Um, as in the tale that we've just heard, the bodies are the bodies of the dead possessed by or acted upon by evil spirits. Um, they leave their graves at night, as we might expect, and they suck blood specifically. Again, there's this narrative of them suffocating people to death. When we disinter them, there's no corruption in the grave. They can be killed with a, and they can be killed with a stake. So this is a small snippet of the actual account idea of dead bodies actuated by infernal spirits and sometimes that sometimes enter people's houses in the night fall upon men women and children and attempt to suffocate them now that's the basic idea that we're getting and this in all of these accounts we're getting a sort of connected idea of the vampire usually as a peasant or an everyday person who is often possessed fairly shambolic in terms of their actions, and they're preying on those around them and then returning to the grave. There's none of these kind of connotations of aristocracy um, or suaveness or power particularly. These are more sort of shambling corpses a lot of the time. So which of these accounts might Byron have been familiar with? Well, there's a possibility that he'd read the Rico. In his annotations to Isaac Disraeli's literary character of Men and Genius, he talks about the reading that he had done that inspired his many, in inverted commas, Eastern writings or Oriental writings. And he mentions the Rico there. Now, this is often understood to be Rico's writings on Turkey, but I don't think it's without the pale of possibility that this also refers to his writings on the Greek and Armenian churches, particularly with Byron's lifelong interest in Greece. So he, he possibly had first-hand knowledge of that account or second-hand knowledge as well of it kind of existed within the British imaginary more broadly, as we see in kind of reports that come out in an, an article that comes out in, I think, 1823 or 1826, which gives the history of the vampire and refers back to this Greek Orthodox excommunication idea. Um, another text that we know he read, of course, was Southey's Talaba the Destroyer. And I'll go back to the poem a bit later, but... Um, at the moment, I want to think about Southey's notes. So Southey wrote a number of notes for the poem, um, which gave very details of vampire law. Now, we know that Byron read it because um, he talks about it a number of times across his letters and diaries. 
um, but we also have reference to it in his satirical English Bards and Scotch Reviewers from 1809, where he says, Talaba, Mr. Southey's second poem, is written in open defiance of precedent and poetry. Mr. S wished to produce something novel and succeeded to a miracle. Talaba was one of those poems which, in the words of Porson, will be read when Homer and Virgil are forgotten, but not till then. He, he really didn't like Southey, if you didn't know, um, and we'll come back to that point later as well. But in Southey's notes, there are references to the Peter Blagovich tale, not by name, but it's that account, the Arnold Paul story, and there's also reference and quotation, extensive quotation, from the work of Joseph Tournefort. So we haven't looked at that one yet. So I wanted to slightly separate it from the more folkloric accounts that we've read, which are usually by travelers or compilers of compendiums that are recording these ideas as beliefs, as superstitions, as folklore. Although perhaps, and particularly in the case of the last two with a curious eye to, well, how do we explain these things? But Tournefort is slightly different. And it's interesting that this is the one that Byron himself acknowledges in his notes to the Jawa, which we'll see in a couple of minutes. So the Jawa is his only poem that includes an extensive section on a vampire. And in the note for it, he says, the vampire superstition is still general in the Levant. Honest Tournefort tells a long story, which Mr. Southey in the notes on Talaba quotes about these brucolacas, as he calls them. The Ramaic, or modern Greek term, is Vardalacha. I recollect a whole family being terrified by the scream of a child, which they imagined must proceed from such a visitation. The Greeks never mention the word without horror. I find that Brukalakas is an old legitimate Hellenic appellation, at least is so applied to Arsenius, who, according to the Greeks, was after his death animated by the devil. The moderns, however, use the word I mention. So a couple of things to note here. There's the clear reference to Southey. It's also picking Tournefort out. There's also the implication that during his travels in um, Greece and the surrounding area, a number of other countries, he had more direct contract with these stories. So he's not simply drawing from the literature. We also have this reference to a death animated by the devil. So still this idea of the vampire as a possessed corpse is certainly one of the things that was inspiring or informing Byron's understanding of the vampire. Now, why have I picked Tunifer out as slightly different? Well, it's the way he writes his voyage into the Levant, which is written in a sort of tragic comic way and very skeptical and at times quite condescending. So it talks about them visiting um, Myconi, as it's written in the text, the peasants of Myconi and the vampire is a peasant of Myconi, naturally ill-natured and quarrelsome, who was murdered in the fields. Now, he was then later seen to walk in the night with great haste, that he tumbled about people's goods, he put out their lamps, he gripped them behind, and a thousand other monkey tricks. There might appear to be spelling mistakes there, guys, but that's a direct trans uh, transcription of the original text. Um, later on, it goes on to refer to more violent symptoms and also the fact that these this supposed vampire is drinking a lot of people's wine. Um, there's a dig at the priesthood that comes in um, when Tunifor is saying that the papas themselves and the priests themselves gave credit to the fact and no doubt had their reasons for doing so. Eyebrows. Masses must be laid. In other words, he's implying that there was a pecuniary motive for them supporting the idea of the vampire. He then goes on to give a description of how the corpse is dealt with. And this goes into a sort of mix of body horror and a comic framing, which, well, you'll see in a second. So they said that they had a mass um, before trying to take the heart out of the body. And they got everything ready for pulling out its heart. The butcher of the town, an old clumsy fellow, first opens the belly instead of the breast and groped a long while among the entrails. In other words, the butcher didn't know where the heart was. He spent quite a lot of time elbows deep in this guy's midriff and then had to be told how to get to the heart. So there's this kind of mixture of grotesquery and this kind of horrifying comedy in the way that the story is uh, sort of told in not just this passage, but in the surrounding passages. Um, the text then goes on to sort of condescendingly explain all of the symptoms. It, the way that it's done is quite sarcastic. 
But all of the sort of signs that are taken as pointing towards him being a vampire are repudiated by the author. So there is smoke around him, but he said, well, that's the incense that we lit because he smelled so strongly of rot. Um, the body's emitting fumes. And the author says, well, dung emits fumes. Um, the butcher said the body was warm. And Twinifor says, well, of course it's warm. It's rotting. Your elbow's deep in a rotting body. Of course it's warm. He says that the, the supposed red blood that came out of the body wasn't really red. It was just kind of dirty muck. Um, and then it goes on to he goes on to explain the tricks that the vampire is supposedly playing by saying that they're being clearly played by an inverted commas vagabonds. And at some point, some of these vagabonds are actually arrested and that stops some of the trouble for a couple of days. Who knew? The explanation that Tonefort gives is an epidemical disease of the brain as dangerous and infectious as the madness of dogs. Um, and says that it was as good as a comedy to us every morning to hear the new follies committed by this night bird. Um, then goes on to detail how the heart burning failed to get rid of the vampire and the various explanations that were given. Um, one of them is that mass was perhaps said at the wrong time. We said mass before we tried to get the heart out. And so the devil hearing the mass ran away and then came back into the body after the heart had been removed. Um, a, a, a sort of a Turkish visitor says, oh, you're using the wrong sword. Your Christian swords look like a crucifix. You need to use a scimitar. But none of this worked. However, eventually they fully destroyed the body and the source of their fear moved from the vampire to the bishop and also um, the Turks. So as for the Turks, it says it is certain that at their next visit, they made the community of Myconi pay dear for their cruelty to this poor rogue. So there's a number of interesting aspects to this tale of the vampire, which I think it's useful to pull out as perhaps things that have influenced ultimately Byron's interactions with the idea of the vampire. The first is this overwhelmingly cynical tone that's being used. The second is this kind of intermixing with comedy to some extent, and this connection of vampirism with mass hallucination and mass hysteria. Also, I think in that last quote, particularly, this idea that what's actually being done to these corpses is a desecration of the body. So this kind of return back to this kind of quite serious critique of what's going on. Now, Byron wasn't only inspired by factual reportings about the vampire, but he is one of the earliest British writers to write the vampire, not the earliest, as we'll see, but he's one of the earliest but he is still drawing from an existing kind of um, interpretation of the vampire into literature. Um, this starts out in Germany, and the first literary vampire is actually, as far as I know, from 1748 in the poem De Vampire by Henrik August Ossenfelder. Now, what is the idea of the vampire that comes through in fiction and poetry? Well, there's not one single idea, but I think this is a quite an interesting starter poem because it, like the Cleland, connects the vampire with sexuality in interesting ways. So the poem goes as follows. This is a translation, obviously. My dear young maiden clingeth and bending fast and firm to all the long-held teaching of a mother ever true, as in vampires and mortal folk on the thesis portal, Haydock like do believe. But my Christine, thou dost dally and wilt my loving parry, till I myself avenging to a vampire's health a-drinking him toast in pale tokay. And as softly thou art sleeping, to thee shall I come creeping, and thy life's blood drain away. And so shalt thou be trembling, for thus shall I be kissing, and death's threshold thou it be crossing with fear in my cold arms. And last shall I thee question, compared to such instruction, what are a mother's charms? So it's interesting that this first um, example of the vampire is male so a lot of the early vampires are female but it's also connected to sort of seduction quite predatory seduction but also quite irresistible seduction in some way as the last three lines suggest now, we don't know if Byron would have read that poem but there are a couple of vampiric texts that we know that Byron read so the first of these is the infamous Tilaba the Destroyer by Robert Southey I say infamous in terms of how Byron regarded it as I've mentioned, Byron was not a fan and he took most opportunities that he could to uh, sort of mock Southey and insult him, as we'll see later. But 
Um, Southey is one of the first in 1801. So I think it's the first published, not the first written, but the first published account of the vampire in British poetry, um, as far as I know. The whole of Tilabla Destroyed is a long epic narrative poem um, about a young man who um, has to go on a sort of mystical quest to defeat magicians, evil magicians and demons. As um, he's theoretically Muslim within the text, this is another, um, in inverted commas, oriental or orientalist um, poem. Um, but he is represented, he's basically Protestantized throughout most of the narrative. He meets um, a beautiful young lady called Anaza, who is good and virtuous and true, um, but she dies partway through and her she appears to return to a graveyard. He is paralyzed by his grief at this point, but goes to sort of see her at the graveyard. And we're told that Anaza stood before them. It was she, her very lineaments and such as death had changed them, livid cheeks and lips of blue. But in her eyes there dwelt brightness more terrible than all the loathsomeness of death. Still art thou living, wretch, in hollow tones, she cried to Talaba. And must I nightly leave my grave to tell thee still in vain God has abandoned thee? The role of the vampire here is that of somebody tempting um, Talaba from his path and trying to disrupt his theologically motivated quest. Um, it carries on for a little bit about Anaza, and we see that um, Talaba can't kill her. And so her own father has to do it, which is pretty grim. Um, when she is killed, um, the demon is expelled from her and Anaza's voice is heard very faintly saying like, I'm free, thank you. Um, and so we do have this sort of idea of possession by an evil spirit, that particular idea of the vampire occurring. We also have this sort of starting to think of the vampire as a sort of tragic figure or a figure of tragedy is occurring within this text. And that's something that we're going to keep seeing in British poetry and particularly British romantic poetry. So another vampire poem that we know Byron read is Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which he describes as one of the wildest and finest poems he'd ever heard. Now Samuel Taylor Coleridge, according to a letter he wrote to Byron, wrote Christabel in 1797, but it wasn't published until 1816. However, Byron had access to a copy, perhaps just orally, it, in 1815 and when he heard it he wrote to Coleridge a letter of um sort of praise and he said Walter Scott repeated to me a considerable portion of an unpublished poem of yours the wildest and finest I ever heard in that kind of composition all took a hold on my imagination which I never shall wish to shake off now worth noting the date here this is 1815 so this is after he wrote the Jower but before some of the other vampire connected incidents we're going to talk about um, but he's clearly moved by this particular representation of the vampire. So what actually happens in Christabel? How is the vampire used? How does it appear? Well, the tale is vampiric but unfinished. So there isn't a clear revelation of the vampiric nature of Geraldine. So Geraldine is a young woman who is found in the woods by Christabel in obvious distress. Something has occurred and she needs help to cross the threshold of the castle with its iron gate. Um, but Christabel takes her to her room and then, as you can see in this image, this is quite a famous, fairly sapphic scene where Geraldine undresses while Christabel watches. And Christabel sees some kind of terrible wound on Geraldine. But when Geraldine gets into the bed with her, there's some kind of spell exacted against Christabel and she cannot speak about what she's seen. Geraldine has some form of control over her. I've talked elsewhere about sort of queer readings and queer theological readings of this text, but that's not the focus today. But what's worth noting are the ideas that are current in this poem, concepts of compulsion, power, influence, wounds and wounding, and also, of course, eroticism. What's particularly noticeable is the idea of the vampire as a dangerous figure, but one who is also cursed and to some extent tragic. So there's these two lines here. It says that once Geraldine had laid down next to Christabel, Geraldine nor speaks nor stirs. Ah, what a stricken look was hers. So this is this of idea of the vampire as an unwilling participant in the vampiric curse, unwilling to do the things that they must do, in other words. So how does how do how does Byron 
right the vampire? How does he fit in with this existing milieu? And how does he use these existing tales of the vampire that we've been thinking about? Well, he writes a sort of long section about a vampire in the Jawa, which he published in 1813. Um, it's a poem that's written in fragments from not one single perspective, but a lot of it is from the perspective of a Muslim fisherman who is watching this Jawa or Christian or infidel riding his horse ungrily away. And we learn that the Jawa had an affair with a woman who was either the married to or the concubine of um, a sort of local dignitary of Sultan, I think. And um, when her adultery was found out, the customary punishment was enacted. She was put in a sack and thrown in the sea. And, and Byron is drawing here from accounts that he heard um, while he was living in um, Greece, Turkey, Albania. Um, so the fight, the second picture that you see here is sort of the end of the narrative where the Jawa ends up, which is in a monastery. Um, but how does how does he get between these two places? Well, the Jawa enacts vengeance on the Sultan and there's a sort of massacre. And what happens um, before he kind of takes himself to a monastery and lives out the rest of his life there is that he is cursed with the following curse that I'm going to read out in a second and which you can see on the page here. Now, don't worry about reading it on the page. What I wanted to show you, and this picture is from the Newstead archives, what I wanted to show you is how the poem is set out in its original printing. So you've got the poem, but you've also got Byron's footnotes about the vampire. There's a footnote that I've already mentioned where he talks about Tournefort and Southey. Um, and then there is a second footnote which mentions that the freshness of the face and the wetness of the lip with blood are the never failing signs of a vampire. The stories told in Hungary and Greece of these foul feeders are singular and some of them most incredibly attested. A couple of interesting things about this. This is somewhat less cynical than um, some of what he will say about the vampire later. It also makes it very clear that he's heard first-hand accounts in Hungary uh, and in Greece, particularly in Greece. Um, and we also have this reference to these kind of folkloric or existing understandings of the vampire, particularly this idea of the vampire's face wet with blood, which is a large inspiration for his verses. So let's have a look at his verses and what he writes, and then I'm going to pick out some salient parts for us about his depiction and use of the vampire. So this is the curse. But first on earth as vampire sent, thy course shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt thy native place and suck the blood of all thy race. There from thy daughter, sister, wife, at midnight drain the stream of life, yet loathe the banquet that perforce must feed thy livid, living course. Thy victims, ere they yet expire, shall know the demon for their sire, as cursing thee, thou cursing them, thy flowers are withered on the stem. But one that for thy crime must fall, the youngest, most beloved of all, shall bless thee with a father's name, that word shall wrap thy heart in flame. Yet must thou end thy task, and mark her cheek's last tinge, her eye's last spark, and the last glassy glance must view, which freezes o'er its lifeless blue. Then with unhallowed hand shall tear the tresses of her yellow hair, of which in life a lock when shorn, affection's fondest pledge was worn, but new is borne away by thee, memorial of thine agony. Wet with thine own best blood shall drip the gnashing tooth and haggard lip, then stalking to thy sullen grave go, and with ghouls and afrits rave, till these in horror shrink away, from spectre more accursed than they. I think it's quite a powerful passage. I think it's some really quite great vampire poetry. But what sort of are some salient points to pick out about this? Well, first of all, no vampires were harmed in the making of this poem. This poem does not depict a vampire. It depicts the idea of a vampire, a curse for somebody to be a vampire, but it doesn't sort of depict a, in inverted commas, real vampire. It draws from the existing folklore and sort of expands on it. So the existing folklore often focuses on the fact that vampires are preying on those they already knew. And in this tale, it's focused, it's zeroed in on the family. Um, we also see underlined this idea of vampirism as curse or as punishment, and partly as divine punishment. 
There's also that imagery of the bloody mouth, which is made to that stark image of your own best blood sort of covering your face, the, the blood of those you love. Now, stick with me here, guys, but there's also a theological critique in the Jawa when you put it within the context of Byron's wider work. So Byron repeats many times in his letters, his writing, that he's not an atheist, that he does believe in a God, but that he is deeply uncomfortable with a lot of Christian religion. And one of the things that he particularly pushes against in his work and in his writing is sort of Calvinist predeterminism, this idea that we are created either for damnation or for salvation, and there's nothing much we can do about that. Um, an idea that leads to this idea of a, a punishing God. Um, that's the wider context, and we see that particularly in works like Cain, but it also can be seen in the way he uses and depicts the vampire. So I've picked out the first two lines here to give a very sort of brief, close reading of. But what's interesting is the way that the message is highlighted by metrical emphasis, i.e. I, where, the, where the emphasis falls. These two lines are in iambic tetrameter, so the emphasis falls on every second word. But first on earth as vampire scent, thy course shall from its tomb be rent. So this emphasis on that word scent and this conception of the vampire being sent against their will. This is a divine punishment. This is something directed by somebody. And the assumption is in the poem that it is some sort of divinity. They also have this emphasis on rent from the tomb shall be rent. The place for a dead body particularly in Christian um, or connected theologies, uh, broadly Christian theologies, is this idea of, you know, the necessity of death to be able to then free the soul. But that cannot occur because the body does not rot for the, for the vampire. And there's a violence to the word rent, which is emphasized by the meter, the idea of wrenching the vampire from its grave and from its possibility of salvation. What comes out is this idea of the horror in this poem isn't just the vampire and what he does, but the horror is the curse itself, is the divine punishment of vampirism, if you will, or the vampirism itself as a curse. And so there is a sort of shade here of a wider theological critique, which creeps through a lot of Byron's work. Another thing to note is here the vampire functions as a tragic figure, one who is committing terrible crimes, but against his will, driven to them. And also one who is made into this by someone or something. So that's Byron's own writing on the vampire, but that isn't his only influence on the history of the vampire. In fact, he's kind of pivotal to the vampire that we have today. How? through his connection to Polidori's The Vampire. So John Polidori's The Vampire from 1819. So let's dive into some of that complicated history. And I'm going to peel apart some of the, the origin claims and the publication disputes, and then also look at what is happening in this story. What is Byron's connection to it? And then how does it influence the idea of the vampire going forwards? I've got three pictures here, and I'm going to come back to these later they'll make more sense as kind of parts of a story. But just to draw them out, we have one edition from 1819 of The Vampire that says it's written by Byron, a second which is written anonymously, and the publisher that is noted there, Sherwood, Neely and Jones, is the one that placed copyright at Stationers Hall. And the last we have a fragment. Who knows what the fragment is? We will see. So there is a question of authorship around um, the story, The Vampire, a question of authorship, of provenance and of publication. Now, the origin comes from that famous meeting at the Via Diodati that produced Frankenstein, of course. But what actually happened and how big was Byron's influence over this story? Well, John Polidori saw that the story was published in the New Monthly magazine of 1819. That's his story that he saw it was published. And so he writes to the um, the publisher, Henry Colburn, and says, you have misattributed it to Byron. Instead, it was written entirely by me at the request of a lady who, upon my mentioning that his lordship had said that it was his intention of writing a ghost story, depending for interest upon the circumstance of two friends leaving England and one dying in Greece, the other finding him alive and making love to his sister, that the lady said that this story couldn't be written. So his claim is that the idea arose from Byron 
at the Via Diodati and that Byron started the story and then gave an outline of the rest of it, the key incidents. So the two friends leaving England, one dying in Greece, then that dead friend being found alive and that dead friend making love to the other protagonist's sister. So was, this is Polidori's claim. And this is what he also reiterates to some extent in his book, uh, in his diary, sorry. But I also wanted to draw out some of this kind of arcana about the Via Diodati, which a lot of people know, but not everybody, and it's worth repeating. So he says that he began his ghost story on June the 18th, but he says he began his ghost story a few times. He also makes it clear that the idea for writing ghost stories came from Byron himself. 12 o'clock really began to talk ghostly. LB, or Lord Byron, repeated some verses from Coleridge's Christabel of the Witch's Breast. When silence ensued and Shelley, suddenly shrieking and putting his hands to his head, ran out of the room with a candle. I threw water in his face and after gave him ether. He was looking at Mrs. S, so Mary Godwin at the time, later Mary Shelley, and suddenly thought of a woman he had heard of who had eyes instead of nipples, which, taking hold of his mind, horrified him. Just a little bit of arcana about how Frankenstein and how the vampire came about there. But this account of the, the Via Diodati and the start of the story is corroborated to some extent by other people. So by Byron. Byron writes to John Murray, his publisher, on May 15th, 1819, from Italy. So he's kind of removed from the situation to some extent. And he's, he's on the back foot trying to um, repudiate his authorship and respond to kind of the debate that's happening. But he says to John Murray, I need not say it is not mine. And he says, basically, you do all my publishing. If you don't publish it, it's not mine. Um, but then he goes on to say, you know, the story of Shelley's agitation is true. They're not exactly as he describes it. The story of the agreement um, to write the ghost books is true. But the ladies are not sisters. So much for scoundrel Southey's story of incest. Neither was there any promiscuous intercourse, whatever. Both are an invention of the execrable villain Southey. So I left this in to show sort of that enduring hatred for Southey coming through. Um, but also this kind of, there's a lot of rumours around this meeting at the Via Diodati. And he's pushing back against some of them. Now, of course, Mary Shelley and Claire Claremont were both there and they're stepsisters, not sisters, which is um, what he's saying here. Um, but his claim that there was no promiscuous intercourse is, of course, not true. He had an affair with uh, Claire Claremont, which led to the birth of Allegra. Um, his illegitimate daughter. Anyway, he then goes on to say, Mary Godwin, now Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Methinks it is wonderful for a girl of 19. He then also encloses the beginning of his story, by which you will see how far it resembles Mr. Colburn's publication. I began it in an old account book of Miss Milbanks, which I kept being the only two scraps I have in the world of her writing. So he sends the beginning of the story that Polidori talked about to prove that he didn't write the full story, but also to show what connection there was between the two of them. He doesn't really directly counter the claim that he had given an outline of the whole story. So that is left sort of slightly unaddressed. I've also left in this last bit, last bit as another bit of sort of arcana around the beginnings and origin of this story. Because he says, I wrote it in an account book of Miss Milbanks, and Miss Milbanks, of course, became Lady Byron. At this point, he'd already they were already separated that they had been married and an acrimonious separation of course it was um, but it's interesting that he says you know this is the only writing I have of hers because I gave back all her letters the only other thing I, I have is the signature on our separation papers and he's written the story in there and he rips it out so as not to lose her writing which I think is an interesting kind of moment and um, the other corroboration we have, of course, is Mary Shelley and the preface to 18, the 1831 Frankenstein. The introduction to the 1818 Frankenstein was written by Percy Shelley, and he only talks about three people being there, Mary, Percy and Byron. Mary Shelley adds a fourth, but she still ignores Claire Claremont. But she says, we will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. There are four of us, and the noble author began a tale, a fragment of which he printed at the end of his poem Mazeppa. Poor Polidori had some terrible idea about a skull-headed lady who was so punished for peeping through a keyhole. What to see, I forget. Something very shocking and wrong, of course. So she's also corroborating the ghost story tale, Byron starting the story as well, which are all things that Polidori claimed. Um, the skull-headed lady is perhaps a mistake on Mary Shelley's part. It's unclear. A number of critics have suggested that this was actually his 
text Ernestus Burke told or the modern Oedipus which features a woman looking through a crack and seeing something rather than being what is seen or rather than being the spectre that's seen so this is the origin and we can kind of nail down a couple of facts right that Byron definitely started a story that Bolidori seems to have picked up on it happened at the Via Diodati it happened as part of the ghost story competition so Let's put the origin to one side and think about the publication disputes that occurred here. So, as I've mentioned, it was already, uh, originally published under Byron's name in the New Monthly magazine in 1819. The publisher of the magazine was Henry Colburn and the editor was Alaric Watts. So Polidori claims that the first time he saw it or in relation to the New Monthly magazine was when he read the story in the magazine. So he says, I received a copy of the magazine of last April, and I'm sorry to find that your Genevan correspondent has led you into a mistake with regard to the tale of the vampire, which is not Lord Byron's, but which was written entirely by me at the request of a lady, which I did in two idle mornings by her side. Um, what's worth noting here for context to understand it is um, the story had had two things appended to it in the New Monthly magazine. The first was a letter from a Genevan correspondent which purported to be an explanation of how the tale arrived at the magazine. But there's a lot of sort of critical suspicion about who actually wrote that um, and if it, if it was a real thing or if it was written by the, the publisher, Henry Colburn. Um, Nick Groom suggests that it was written by Colburn and that all of the information in it could be found elsewhere um, and could be found as well in Polidori's diary. So... Um, there's a potential, uh, we'll go on to that kind of potential for collaboration between Polidori and Colburn in publishing The Vampire Under Byron's Name. Um, but popping that to one side for a second, um, there is, uh, attached to the story, there's a letter from the Geneva correspondent, and there's also an introduction to the vampire um, and to give, the, give some vampire lore. So this is Polidori's claim, but the mystery deepens. Um, because the publisher and the editor fell out and what goes to Murray, Byron's publisher, and this is what Murray writes to Byron, that the editor of that journal has quarrelled with the publisher and has called this morning to exculpate himself from the baseness of the transaction. He says that he received it from Dr. Polidori for a small sum and that this fact, the editor inserted it with a short statement to this effect, but to his astonishment, Colburn cancelled the leaf. So the implication here is that Polidori sold the story himself, connected it to Byron, probably saying it was influenced by Byron. And it's a story that Byron kind of wrote the outline to or made the outline to. Um, and that there was a note that kind of hedged its bets a little bit, but that that note was taken out and the publisher just put Byron in order to sell the paper, in order to sell uh, the story. Um, so this is the other interpretation of what potentially happened. Now, Byron, off in Italy, is completely confused about what's happened in the sequence of events. He writes to a French newspaper, The Galignani's Messenger, denying authorship and suggesting that somebody there has, has made a sort of an imposture, a sort of imposter's document. And he goes on sort of really kind of hammer the nail home by saying, I have besides a personal dislike to vampires. And the little acquaintance I have with them would by no means induce me to divulge their secrets. Hmm. Interesting in the light of the Jower, but we'll go on to see how that statement might still be true or how we can understand that statement in relation to how he uses the vampire across his work. Um, we don't really know exactly what happened. A number of critics suggest that what is perhaps the most believable story but what we do know is that the story was published under Byron's name originally, and it continued to be published under his name intermittently throughout the 19th century, although it was also published anonymously. Um, Goethe was certainly fooled, thinking it was Byron's greatest work. Now, Byron had sent, as we saw, his fragment, his beginning fragment to Murray, and had asked him to publish it in a periodical with a note explaining what it was so that people could judge for themselves the connection between the two stories. Murray ignored that though and did something somewhat different. So here we've got these images again. We've got the tale attributed to Byron, the anonymous version of the tale straight away in 1819 that, that error in inverted commas is corrected. And then we have this fragment. So what Murray did instead of publishing it with a note in a periodical was he attached it to the end of Byron's Mazeppa um, his poem about a man being a naked man being strapped to a horse. 
um, with no explanation. And this led to sort of it, it being attacked critically. And Byron was angry both with Polidori and Murray because of the situation. So let's get into the actual text. Um, what does Byron's fragment offer in terms of its depiction of the vampire and its, its sort of shaping of um, Polidori's story? Well, Polidori laid out those different components of the story, that two friends leave England, one die in Greece, and then one finds the dead one alive, and the dead one is making love to his sister. In Byron's fragments, only the first two are true. Two friends leave England together, and then one dies in Greece. In Byron's fragments, the narrator is a young, unnamed friend of a man called Augustus Darvel. And Augustus Darvel is a kind of Byronic figure, potentially a hero, potentially an anti-hero. We never get far enough to really know. Um, the narrator says of him, I could still gather from the whole that he was a being of no common order and one who, whatever pains he might take to avoid remark, would still be remarkable. Um, so clearly this idea of the, the superior man here, but still the outcast and exile as well, or the one who stands apart from society. Um, the story goes on, they travel together, and eventually they come to this graveyard, which theoretically nobody's visited before, but Augustus Darvel weirdly knows where the water is. There are some strange signs up in this graveyard, including a stork eating a serpent, and this is where Darvel dies, at which point two promises are extracted from our young narrator. The first is to tell no one of his death. And the second, quite detailed, randomly, is that on the ninth day of the month, at noon precisely, what month you please, but this must be the day, you must fling this ring into the salt springs which run into the Bay of Eleusis. The day after, at the same hour, you must repair to the ruins of the Temple of Ceres and wait one hour. And that's where the story ends. We never get to see what happens, whether he comes back from the dead, whether he's a vampire, but um, according to Polidori, that was the original intent of the story, that he would be. So what is Polidori's story and how does it draw from this? Well, there are a number of differences to start with. First of all, there's the introduction, as I noted, which was probably written not by Polidori, but by Alaric Watts, the editor, um, although can't confirm that. And it included a range of different ideas of the vampire, not necessarily related to the vampire as it appears in the text. The Arnold Paul case is mentioned, the Greek Orthodox explanation, the tournifor, and also references made to the Jawa and Talaba the Destroyer. I'll tell it's not written by Byron because Talaba the Destroyer is fulsomely praised. Um, another key change is the name of the vampiric protagonist from Augustus Darvel to Riven, or Lord Riven. Now, this is a particularly important name, as our Byronists will know, because this is the name that Lady Caroline Lamb gave to her villain based on Byron in the Romanoclef Glenarvan. And we know that Polidori would have known about this at the time because we can see comparing Polidori's diaries to Byron that this is exactly the same point where Byron was really quite annoyed about Glenarvan and reading it um, when he was with Polidori. So what Polidori does is he takes the sort of putative Byronic hero of um, the original fragment and he makes him an anti-byronic hero so at first we're introduced to him as a man that stands apart from the crowd that seems superior to it but that is fine sort of slowly peeled away and he's shown to be quite venal um underneath he's shown to be a sort of a, a commonplace villain in many ways um instead of this sort of friendship they have an uneasy traveling relationship as the young narrator aubrey he has a name in this one realizes that something is up with Lord Riven and that people were right to be worried about him. Riven's propensities or evil is modeled on known traits of Byron, but sort of twisted and, and corrupted um, into signs of evil or definite signs of evil. Um, so one of the things that Riven does is he's very generous, but he only gives his money to people who will then use it for bad purposes. He also seems to be completely immune to sort of seducing young women. But then we find kind of behind the scenes, he's been seducing married ladies all over the place and the most difficult victims, if you will. So um, this is something that obviously Byron was known for, particularly was his um, relationships with, with married women. Um, something that 
Polidori adds is to the vampiric law is this idea that the vampire needs to consume a woman a year, virgin, in order to survive. Um, when the young hero Aubrey, or when the young uh, sort of traveling companion Aubrey realizes something is wrong with Lord Riven, they split up. Um, Aubrey goes to Greece and he meets Ianthe, who he sort of falls in love with. But one night he stays out too late. Ianthe goes after him and she's killed by a vampire. And he sees the vampire, doesn't recognize him. Um, and he falls into, you know, a faint and then has a fever for a while. And, oh, look who's there looking after him. Oh, it's Lord Ripon. What a coincidence. Who knew? Probably there's nothing nothing to do with Ianthe's death. And so then they continue to travel together, at which point Ripon dies. Um in a similar manner, but he leaves much clearer instructions for Aubrey. He says, okay, don't tell anyone I'm dead and bury me, you know, at moonlight at this time up in this place. Simple. When Aubrey returns to England, he finds Riven alive. And this sort of slowly drives him mad as he finds himself unable to tell people about what has happened to Riven. And we don't know if that's purely he he doesn't want to break his word, but it seems to be an almost physical, at least psychological compulsion. Um, and then we have Riven chooses his next victim and the victim is Aubrey's sister. So the vampiric figure is revealed to be this emotionless, ruthless predator. So I think it's interesting to do a comparison here of how they write or view the vampire. Um, there's a clear connections between the two of them, but the vampire takes, as I've mentioned, that Byronic figure and kind of uncovers the dark underside of it, says that this isn't a hero, this is a villain. Um, so in The Vampire, we have Aubrey as the narrator, virtuous, naive, and steadfast, and he takes the Polidori role, essentially. Whereas in Augustus Darville, the narrator is unnamed and largely uncharacterized. The main character is this kind of Byronically tormented Augustus Darville. In The Vampire, Aubrey is first deceived and then undeceived as to Riven's character. But in Augustus Darville, there's no certainty of deception or condemnation. Nothing is revealed um, to suggest that August Darville is definitely a villain. Riven's superiority is questioned, whereas Darville's superiority or difference from the crowd is confirmed. Riven in The Vampire is shown to be licentious and abandoned, whereas Darville is temperate and controlled. Riven appears to be emotionless and amoral, whereas Augustus Darville is under some kind of romantic burden. Now, interestingly, it's this more Byronic version of the vampire that we have today, rather than the anti-Byronic um, vampire that Pol Polidori produces. But Polidori's narrative certainly had a massive effect. Um, it introduced a kind of young, not young, but the seductive, magnetic, aristocratic vampire, a uh, male vampire to literature. And it had a massive effect, of course, on the development of the vampire through Varney the vampire in the Penny Dreadfuls to, of course, Dracula and the vampires that we have today. Um, but those vampires like Dracula, for example, continue to be evil. So that's this is still within that sort of Polidori trend. The vampires that we have today, where we're reassessing what evil is, that's more in line with what Byron was potentially doing. So there's a sort of interesting interrelation of Byron, Polidori, and the afterlives of the vampire that are transmitted through Polidori's story. So it's not just Polidori that Byron influences, we've already seen. In the immediate aftermath, there's quite a lot of influence of Polidori's story, and through it, potentially Byron. Um, James Robinson Planche's Bride of the Isles is one of these examples, and that's one of the pictures from the first slide that I wanted to show you. This was there are, there are numerous editions, stage editions of the Vampire by Polidori, with numerous changes. And Planche set his in Scotland, as you can see here, the lady reclining in a sort of Grecian dress and also a plaid, and then a vampire wearing a kilt and a sheet, seemingly and looking quite upset about life. Um, there's a couple of reasons it was Scottish. The first is the costumes that were available, but I also like to think there's maybe a, a sort of hint here of Byron's Scottish background. Now, thinking a little bit less directly about the connection of Byron and the vampire in the imagination, we can look at the Brontes. Now, we know about the Byronic influence on the Brontes and particularly on their heroes or anti-heroes like Rochester and, of course, um, Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. There's also this interweaving with the concept of the vampire, which I think is quite interesting in Wuthering Heights. So Nellie D muses, is he a ghoul or a vampire? I'd read of such hideous incarnate demons. 
and I set myself to reflect how I tended him in infancy and watched him grow to youth, and followed him almost through his whole course, and what absurd nonsense it was to yield to that sense of horror. But where did he come from? The little dark thing harboured by a good man to his bane. So there's a connection between the idea of the vampire here and the idea of the Byronic anti-hero. Um, you know, she looks at, oh, I knew this man from a child. This isn't some kind of creature. He's not some kind of creature of the night. But there's also an overlap in how these characters function and um, how they interact with the text, which I think we continue to see in the overlap of the Byronic and the vampire in characters as diverse as Lestat de Leoncourt and, of course, horrifyingly, Edward Cullen in Twilight. There are also more direct connections between the vampire and Byron in novels like The Vampire by Tom Holland, where Byron is a vampire, and one of my favourites, the graphic novel Bloodlust and Bonnets, where this time Byron is fighting vampires. This is my favourite image from it. Byron introduces himself. It is I, Lord Byron, you know, from books. That's what I think of every time I think of Byron. So let's round it off here. We're thinking about, more broadly, how Byron interacts with the idea of the vampire and how we deal with his statement that he had a personal dislike to vampires. Did he really? How do we understand this when we can see the vampire sort of peering out through his writing? Well, one thing that I want to draw out as a possible explanation for mixed feelings towards the vampire is the impact of the tournefort. And we mentioned how cynical it is, but I didn't use, show you this quote from the end of his account. But Tinefo says, after such an instance of folly, can we refuse to own that the present Greeks are no great Grecians, that there is nothing but ignorance and superstition among them? This idea of comparing modern Greeks with sort of a worshipful version of ancient Greeks is something that occurs in a lot of Byron's early work. But it's also something that clearly at the end of his life, in the fight for Greek independence, he turned from. I think there's this connection of the idea of the real vampire in some ways with this idea of superstition and this connection to this particular judgment of Tournefort against Greece. So I think it's interesting that technically speaking, Byron never wrote a vampire. In the Jower, it's a curse. In an Augustus Darville, he stops before he ever writes the vampiric section of the narrative. So he always stops before putting a real vampire on page. The vampire in Byron stays an idea a way of exploring different things, a way of, as we'll see, exploring ideas of alienation, of punishment, of theology, a way of um, perhaps articulating for himself a conception of the Byronic hero, but he couldn't quite do it. He couldn't quite write the vampire, either because he simply lost interest or because of this slightly mixed feeling about the figure of the vampire. Although, of course, I should say that whenever we have a statement like this by Byron, we should take it with a pinch of salt. Um, one statement by Byron in one letter is never something that you can take as the full gospel truth about everything, because he will write different opinions in different letters. He's a human being and he changes his mind across time. He also tends to react passionately to things. And so I think we need to, to sort of look at this section and not dismiss it, that this um, assertion not dismiss it simply we can unpack it and see like oh how does this idea perhaps illuminate what he does and doesn't do with the vampire but we shouldn't also take it to be a sort of gospel representation of his dislike of vampires he clearly refers to vampires quite a lot and uses them not only in his writing and his poetry and his fiction but also in his sort of everyday writing so i wanted to draw out two last things to finish the way he uses the vampire as a figure and the vampire as idea in Byron's works. So the vampire as a figure, um, this is occurring in one of his letters, and we're mixing together poetry and letter here, but this is essentially political commentary. So in a letter to his correspondent, Lady Melbourne, on April 7th, 1813, he talks about the event that we can see in the satirical print to one side, which is the Prince Regent being present at the opening of the tombs of Charles I and Henry VIII. So this is the poem to the discover of the bodies of Charles I and Henry VIII. And it says, famed for their civil and domestic quarrels, see heartless Henry lies by headless Charles. Between them stands another sceptred thing. It lives, it reigns, I every inch a king. 
The double tyrant starts at once to life. Justice and death have mixed their dust in vain. Each royal vampire quits his vault again. Cursed be the tomb that could so soon disgorge two such to make a Jan Janus or a George. George, of course, being the Prince Regent. Now, the use of vampire here is quite clearly sort of allegorical, metaphorical. And it reminds us of that 1732 article we saw, this idea of the political vampire sucking the metaphorical blood of the populace. Um, he also used the vampire figure somewhat casually in some of his letters. So in a letter to John Murray in 1813, he says, you know, I wish the printer was saddled with a vampire. So these are two examples which show how Byron uses it in this metaphorical sense, in this kind of funning sense as well. It also showed how the image of the vampire existed in the cultural imaginary as a figure to be used as allegory, as metaphor. Um, and I think it also reflects that somewhat comic engagement with the vampire that he perhaps adapted from, inherited from Torn for. But let's go back and finish on this, this concept of the vampire as idea in Byron's work, where he uses the, the vampire as an idea to explore other themes. So the vampire in the British imaginary has always had symbolic value because it, it's not being investigated as real. It's always being um, sort of depicted as a creature which then is loaded with different meanings. Byron uses and engages with the folkloric elements, but also explores what they can mean, what they can tell us. In the Jawa, the idea of the bloody face transforms into this idea of the, the blood of one's family that then becomes kind of metaphorically this idea of how one can end up destroying one's own family with their actions, something that perhaps Byron was particularly attuned to. Byron also uses the theological potential of the vampire, questions of immortality and of damnation, particularly in the Jawa. And he exploits its allegorical potential, both in the writing we've just seen and more broadly in his work, particularly the idea of how the vampire can represent and be used to interrogate ideas of exile, isolation and alienation. It's worth noting that when he was writing his Augustus Darvel fragment, this was in 1816, the year that he was essentially exiled from Britain after his disastrous marriage, when he left Britain and, and viewed it as an exile. We also see the vampire as having the potential, as having Byronic potential, the exploration of that kind of key Byronic type figure, the outsider, the outcast, who is yet somehow both superior and damned by fate. Then we also see how this can be turned in the work of people like Polidori to the anti-Byronic potential of the vampire. So I hope this has given you a quick introduction to the relationship between Byron and the vampire, some fun arcana to, um, to go into about the writing of different texts. And if you have any questions, this is the perfect time to ask them.